fire safe, a little summary. Fire safety, well, it's our bread and butter. It's how to reduce fire within your house, how that can Im impact on your cost of living through safe cooking, safe heating, lighting and electrics, best practices, and also what can, what can the fire service do for you? I'll start first on common misconceptions. Um, my biggest bugbear is people watching television, watching movies, TV shows, and they, they see like some heroic scene, you know, whether it be like Backdraft, Chicago Fire, CSI, or even all the way down to EastEnders and Coronation Street. They'll try and drive up numbers by showing like a big explosion or a big fire. And then in EastEnders, you see Phil Mitchell or one of the Mitchell brothers running bravely into the into the, the, the Queen Vic be nothing more than a dishcloth wrapped around their heads and that somehow protects them against the effects of fire and smoke inhalation. It's nothing like that. I'll show you a little fiction versus fact thing. This is a little screen grab from Backdraft, everyone's favourite film in the early 90s. Early 90s had a lot of fire, fire films coming out. It's a bit like how Marvel is right now with um, all the superhero films. It was Fire Service back in the 90s. And there you see Kurt Russell single-handedly lifting up two firefighters with like a bear hug. So that's about 25 stone of firefighters that he's picking up and it's totally unrealistic. On the right-hand side, you've actually got a fact. This is uh, a training video from a few years ago and it's a firefighter going into a room that's full of fire. And the problem is you can't see the fire. I've had firefighters over the years tell me it's an event of a fire. They go in and do their search pattern they can shine a torch in front of their face when they've got their breathing apparatus on and they cannot see the light from that torch. So I filled in the blanks for you and I drew a cracking wee firefighter where he should be. So if I bring that back, so there's the firefighter just sitting there. He's on one knee and he's uh, pulsing a jet of water into, into smoke and they just do that until the fire reduces. Compare that to backdraft on the left-hand side. It's, it's, it's chalk and cheese. That's the biggest issue for us, that people watch this kind of stuff. They watch television shows and they think, well, that's what real fire is like. And every firefighter in Scotland will tell you, absolutely not. I've got a little video here and I'll let it play, but I'll narrate it as well. So what we've done was we've designed a, a living room a few years ago and we started a small fire in the corner on the couch. And then the fire just starts to develop naturally. After 30 seconds, the fire is when you reach the point where it's actually too much to put out with like, you know, like a basin of water. But the main thing about fire is it doesn't, it doesn't crackle and it doesn't make noise like a, like a bonfire. So you might not even hear it starting. That's where your smoke detectors come into play. This is only after a minute. And you can also see that you can start to see that the flames are starting to touch the, the top of the ceiling. The smoke is starting to descend from the top. You're looking at a couple of hundred degrees now. You're well beyond the realm of anyone in their own house trying to put out that fire because the heat is actually too unbearable. It's like standing right next to like a massive heater. Everything starts to spread around. After two minutes, it starts to spread onto the furniture as well. And firefighters call this moment that's coming up here the flashover. The flashover is when the temperature in that room becomes so hot that even things that aren't on fire just start to spontaneously combust. Uh, and at that point there, it's it's always get out, stay out, call 999. Now, in that situation, the, the, the firefighters wouldn't go into that room. They would just use our correct procedures. Kurt Russell and Backdraft would stand no chance, and neither would we. So that's why we always try and recommend people to get out, stay out, and call 999, because we'd much rather you get a new house, rebuild a new house and trying to rebuild a broken life because somebody's unfortunately lost their life. And that's the main thing that the fire service try to do is to reduce fire within the community and doing that will end up reducing fatalities as well. So that's kind of like the, the stuff that the fire service does, but we'll move on to cost of living. We want to try and avoid that from happening in the first place. And it's a vicious circle. You want to save money. So how do you do that? You try to reduce your costs. 
you reduce your cost by looking at what are the things that's costing money. Do you really need all those sports channels? Do you need all those movie channels? Maybe take a couple of the cartoon channels away. You want to, you know, get a cheaper phone bill. And once you've exhausted all those options, then you'll start to seek alternatives. And this is where you're starting to go into the realm of, you know, like unsafe practices. And a lot of my stuff in this presentation is purely for me spending half an hour on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and just typing in the hashtag cost of living and then a few other bits and pieces just to see what comes up. And then you start to see these trends and life hacks. And these trends and life hacks, these are like unproven methods on ways to reduce costs. And it increases your risk within your house. And then you start to compromise your safety. The biggest one for us, I mean, 75% roughly of all domestic fires starts in the kitchen. So we can reduce dangerous cooking. But people are switching to these alternatives and it's a huge worry for us. Outdoor barbecues, they're taking them indoors. They're, these are the little temporary barbecues that you can get in the pound shop for a couple of pounds. And you know, they, they last about 50 minutes, but they're putting them in their kitchen. They're massively increasing their fire risk within their home because what happens if the cold spread or whatnot, it's, it's meant to be used in an outdoor setting. And the same also goes for camping gas stoves. You go to like a, uh, an outdoor shop and you buy camping gas stoves, huge risk, huge risk for us, especially when it comes to carbon monoxide as well. And a, not a well ventilated room, it can, increase carbon monoxide and we'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Cooking in kettles, now this is a new one for me, I was a bit surprised to find a video of it, but people are trying to reduce costs, it costs quite a bit of money to, to now run your cooker, especially if it's a gas and an electric or an induction hob, so what are they doing? They're actually cooking in their kettles, and I've seen a video where somebody says instant noodles instantly, and they put instant noodles in a kettle, fill it up with water, and then press boil, Kettles are designed to click off when they're boiled, but they either sellotape the power button on or they hold it down with their finger. And the, the danger of that is um, you're overheating the element. It's only designed to click off as soon as it reaches boil, but if it's over boiling for like five or 10 minutes, then you're increasing the risk of something going wrong with that appliance. And plus, you're, you're going to end up getting sticky noodles in your kettle. So making someone a cup of tea and they're, they're chewing on it rather than drinking it. Um, candles as well. Candles has always been a massive risk, especially for the fire service. People like them. People like the scent. People like the effect of them. Um, but people are starting to use candles to cook now. And there, there are a variety of candles out there. But the biggest one that we've got to worry about is the tea light candle. It's the little one with the metal rim around it. And it's not designed for domestic use. That's that's the main issue. And this is a this is another new one. It's a bit like cooking in a kettle. People gather wood and they put it in a foil takeaway container that they can buy cheaply. You can buy a pack of 10 for like two pounds or something like that. And they put wood in it and then they put some lighter fluid and they, they light it um that's a way to cook food it's like if you're wanting a barbecue take it outside use an outdoor barbecue but please don't take it indoors and please don't try and come up with your own um new methods of cooking your food um i know where this where the fire service but it's like i've started you know batch cooking food stick it a nice load of curry last a couple of days freeze the rest in the freezer sitting in there whenever you want it again stick it in the microwave a couple of minutes de uh, defrost it and whatnot and that's you got a fully prepared meal and you're only using the energy from the microwave rather than the electricity or the gas for a cooker um, there are a lot of wee methods out there that doesn't actually require you delving into dangerous cooking another one for us especially when we're hitting um winter time near christmas is dangerous heating so when I started doing this presentation, I wanted to look into DIY heating because I have heard of a few, you know, life hacks, like in air quotes, a terracotta clay pot with candles. And I actually Googled terracotta clay pot heating. And the first advert that came up on Google was somebody selling them on eBay for 35 to 40 pounds. And that's, 
it's, be, it's beggar's belief that someone would pay nearly 40 quid for two little clay pots, one on top of each other with a bolt running through it. And, you, and they also said, buy now and get 53 candles. And I was like, that that's absolutely some deal, 40 quid for pots and candles. Um, but the other danger of it is because the, the clay pots, they're made out of clay, they can retain a massive amount of heat and people don't realise how hot they can get. And when the candles burn out, you might touch them and you might burn them. And another issue is it can create a funnel effect underneath the pots where the candles are and it can set fire to, to nearby curtains or other fabrics that are that are flammable. Calor gas burners, uh, I have noticed, especially doing home fire safety visits, that people are switching to the old school way. You know, the stuff that uh, your, your granny or granda, because my, my gran used to have a calor gas burner, but the main issue is that they haven't been used in about 20 years, or you're buying them brand new, but uh, that little nostalgia trip of your granny using it, and then you're using it yourself, are you using it properly? Are you using it in a safe environment? Do you keep it away from other surfaces? Um, Calor gas burners can increase the risk of carbon monoxide poisoning as well, especially if you don't use well ventilation. If you don't, you need to crack a window open, you need to crack a door open a little bit just to allow the, the gas burner to actually breathe like us. Um, fire needs three things in order to be a fire. It needs fuel, it needs heat, and it needs what we need, oxygen as well. If that starts robbing you of oxygen, you get inefficient burning, carbon monoxide, and that that headache can prove fatal. Wood burners, this is this is a, a definite increase for us as people getting wood burners. If it's installed properly by a qualified person or somebody who knows what they're doing, yeah, they're, they're excellent additions to the home. The the wood pellets or the woods themselves, they, they are cheap and cheerful to buy. But um, what we're worried about is people trying to do a DIY job. Um, I saw something on the news. Somebody tried to build their own wood burner themselves. So they, they, they bought it. They put it in where the old back boiler was in their old tenement flat. But what they didn't realize was that the, the chimney was lined with UPVC plastic as the flue. Now, a proper installer would have taken all that down and put in a metal sheet. But instead, they just installed the wood burner themselves, put in a couple of bits of wood, and then liquid plastic started dripping down into the wood burner and nearly set fire to the entire house, all because they wanted to save some money and do it themselves. Um, you, you get what you pay for. Um, DIY jobs, if you know what you're doing, is absolutely fantastic. But people are going into, people are researching these things themselves, but not with the confidence and the knowledge of what to do. And another thing about the wood burners is that they try and save some money by not buying them in the shops. Uh, and they, they've got like a back garden and they've got trees. They might get twigs and branches and stuff. Is, is that the correct wood? We have the Clean Air Act in Scotland. And if you're burning the wrong stuff and it produces too much smoke, is it treated wood? Is it special? Is it, the sap can burn and produce toxic fumes as well. So these are all the things that you need to look out for. Stick to the legitimate stuff. It may cost money, but again, we'd, we'd rather you spend money than actually putting your life in risk by trying to save a couple of pounds. And in saying that, we're modifying diesel heaters. You know, you've got your, you've got your sliding doors out to your back garden and you've got a diesel heater sitting outside. Um, people say that it saves a lot of money because it just sips diesel, but you're, you're introducing these fumes and that into a home environment. And the biggest worry that we've got is that people leaving them on for too long. They're, they're only meant for caravan use in big open areas, not for like closed off areas. Um, but there's not a lot of like free air to help to help the, the diesel heater breathe, basically. And it needs air to, to run properly and the fumes can be quite nasty. Gas company um, off-peak incentives. Um, it's been in the news quite a lot that gas companies are trying to encourage people to use certain things at certain times of the day to reduce load on the gas supplies. Uh, one thing, you, you need one of these two things or both. You need a, a dual meter, an economy, or white meter heating, the old school way of calling it, or you need to actually be on that plan. So you, you don't you don't just get it automatically. You need to actually apply for it. And people are getting a little bit confused about that. And the worst one that I've seen is people try to bypass their meter. That 
enough said about that kind of thing. It can cause a, a gas explosion within your property, especially if someone's tinkering with like the mains gas supply coming into your house. But you'll probably already already know the dangers associated with that. Dangerous lighting and electrics. Again, we're going back to candles. Try to light up their homes, and people are using the tea light candles. Tea light candles are meant to be used in a restaurant setting to keep food or tea warm. They only produce half as much light as a normal style candle, you know, the, the, the long thin one, and they burn twice as fast and twice as hot. It's, it's a big concern. If you're wanting to use these candles, please ensure that you're using them safely, putting them on a ceramic top or and away from sources of ignition like a little window opened and the curtains are blown on it. Modifying sealed electrics, they're trying to modify things that are not accessible for repair um, to try and fix them. Like I, uh, chargers for their phones, chargers for their laptops. Most of these are actually sealed units and they have quite a lot of electricity stored within, within them in what's called capacitors. You pry that apart, even if it's unplugged, it can still retain electricity. Overloading sockets, um, that's a huge concern for us, even out with cost of living. They try and overload a socket. Now, every socket in your house can deliver 13 amps of power, but there are certain things that need to be plugged straight into the wall and not into a, a, a bar adapter. So things like anything that heats up or cools down most likely uses 13 amps. So I'm talking about kettles, toasters, washing machines, dishwashers, tumble dryers, fridge freezers as well. They all use 13 amps and they should be plugged straight into the wall. Please don't encourage yourself to overload a socket. Um, I've been into a few houses where they've got four, four things plugged into the one socket and it's all high energy appliances. 13 times four, 52 amps running through a single socket. You, you'll end up getting power cuts, your your fuse box will start tripping or your uh, you need to reset your circuit breakers more often than not. And plus you're putting a strain on the electrical supply. Bypassing safety features. Um, this is a very old school way of it, but it's like some people, uh, they find that a fuse is blown within their socket. They take, they take the plug apart, they find that the fuse is bust and they don't have a replacement for it. So they try and bypass it with something like tinfoil or a nail. Now, unless you're a, a metallurgist or someone who's got a degree in metal alloys, you don't know how much power that those things that you've plugged into it can be capable of. At least with a fuse, you've got a three, a five or a 13 amp, you know that that is what you get and you're increasing your risk of fire, especially within the socket, because you're completely bypassing the main thing that makes the British socket so safe is the fuse itself. So people try and bypass them and can uh, start a fire within their electrics. Again, the off-peak incentives, the white meter heating can apply for your electric as well. Uh, the fire service always recommends that you do not run a high-powered appliance at night time, even if it's on off-peak. So see, the, uh, see the, the wash machine, the tumble dryer, or the dishwasher, please run it during the day. Because the only time, if you're in a deep sleep and something were to happen, the only thing in your house that actually lets you know that something is on fire is your smoke detector. And if you're in a deep sleep, um, that's the first thing that's waking you up. How often do you test your smoke detector? Well, we, the fire service calls it test it Tuesday. So test it every week. If it's not working, get a new one. And another old school one, electric by uh, meter bypass. Um, not only is it illegal, but people botch them all the time. They don't understand uh, the concept of overloading wires and they end up creating like a small fire within their electric box. Um, and it's, it's just not worth it. It really isn't. Best practices. What can we say to try and like reduce the risk, but also save you some money? Candle safety. If you're wanting, if you're if you're desperate to use a candle, I would always recommend that you use the little electric ones with the little button cell batteries inside them. Uh, my parents have them in their house, and see from a distance, you can't tell the difference between that and a real candle. You can get four of them for a pound in the shops, and there's virtually no fire risk to them in comparison to a real candle itself. Um, and plus, you can put them in places you can't put a real candle. That's that's the benefit of them. And I've seen some ones that you can get in the shops now where the actual material that it's made out of does have scents embedded within it. 
So my parents have one that smells like vanilla, and it works. It really does work. And some the bigger ones runs off remote control batteries, AAA batteries. That's much better than a naked flame, because that's that's what a candle is. It's, it is a fire. It is a small fire, and it's only being contained by whatever container that you that you safely put it in. Chimney maintenance. Again, that goes back to uh, having a, a wood burner in your living room or any other room within your house. If you're burning wood, if, they, if you burn the correct wood, then you would have like a maintenance plan on getting a chimney sweep to actually sweep it. If you try and reduce costs by using your own provided wood that's been chopped down from the outside, um, it can produce sticky viscous material that actually coats the inside of your chimney and it can, it can choke a chimney. And the fire service, believe it or not, in the past year, has been to over a thousand chimney fires and we're expecting that number to rise especially when people are switching to alternative methods of heating so even when chimneys are out of vogue we still go to like a thousand of them portable heaters the good old-fashioned long electric heater that you pull out of the cupboard when it's getting too cold um i've used them as well but if you're going to if they've been not in use for a while give it a wee courtesy of giving it a clean most people will remember that smell of turning on an electric heater for the first time in ages and you smell that burning smell that is dust um put a hair dryer give give a hair dryer on the cold setting give it a quick blast get all the dust out from that portable heater and you're good to go electrical safety don't overload your sockets we're trying to promote safe living um switch off and unplug things when you're not using them if you're going out and about, if, literally every penny counts. Uh, before cost of living, before Corona, back when Corona was just known as a as a drink with a, a lime in it, the fire service always advised people about switching things off. I went to a family in Castlemilk in one of the townhouse flats to a uh, mum and a dad and four kids. And the kids had everything, all the mod cons, they had everything plugged in, but they were... The parents were worried because they were using too much electricity and I advised them to turn things off when they go to bed at night. Not leave things on charge. Your phone chargers, your laptop chargers, even every once in a while, turn off your Wi-Fi or, uh, or your um, your TV box. Let electrics cool down. Cool electrics run better. It also reduces your costs, which is the whole point in cost of living. But more importantly for us, it reduces your fire risk can't have a fire or in an appliance if it's not plugged in and turned on. It, it does save money. That family in Castlemilk actually saved them £70 that year when I visited them the next year. Um, and that just goes to show that it does work, especially when we're not in this cost of living situation. Electric blankets. Um, it's always a popular choice. If you're wanting to use them, make sure they've got a proper plug on them. You know, don't use the one that's been sitting in, in a cupboard for 10 years. You know, if you're getting a new one, make sure it's a proper one with a proper plug and also it doesn't get overused. Um, they can be fantastic, but as long as they're used safely. 10 minutes before you go to bed, turn it on. And number three, give it a quick blast of heat, then turn it off when you go to bed. A lot of people do forget that. Safe cooking methods. If you're going to be cooking a lot of stuff, again, my suggestion, freeze things. When you finish using them, stick them in the freezer, um, using the microwave, a microwave running for three minutes at um, 800 watts is much better than cooking something in, a, in an oven, an electric oven that runs at 3000 watts for 25 minutes. So it, it does add up. Escape routes within your house, always make sure that you have an escape route. The amount of times that the fire service goes to visit people's houses and you, you, you try and determine an escape route for them by discussing it with the family, but they've got bikes, they've got other miscellaneous things blocking their escape route. Um, all it takes is for you to wake up in a panic one night, you smell smoke, the smoke alarm's beeping, you try to gather the family, and it's in the middle of the night, there's no lights, and you, you stumble over like something that's blocked your, your exit path. It can be very easily rectified. It takes five minutes at most. And a bedtime routine. I mean, my bedtime routine is just to turn off the electrics, see stuff that I'm not using, switch off and unplug. Close over doors as well. It does keep the heat in, especially. And more importantly, it does reduce your risk of fire. 
if you were to leave every door open in your house, it can take a fire three minutes to go from one side of the room, one side of the house and another side of the house. But let's say you close your th uh, three doors between you and a kitchen that's on fire, you've taken that three minutes and extended it to 15 minutes at least per door. So three minutes, 15 times three, 45 minutes. And the fire service always tries to be your house, definitely in less time than that. And most importantly, carbon monoxide awareness. If you're if you're going to if you're going to be using other methods of heating your home, please make sure that you have well um, ventilation. Keep a wee crack in your window open. It might be letting in the cold air, but you're you're, you're allowing a, a heating appliances to breathe the same the way that you do. Have a carbon monoxide detector next to every or within the vicinity of every gas burning appliance. One carbon monoxide sometimes isn't enough, especially if you've got a boiler in the room and then you've got a gas cooker down the stairs. That would mean that you would need two carbon monoxide detectors, not just one for the kitchen. So what can the fire service do to assist? Um, our bread and butter is home fire safety visits. You can contact the fire service. You can you can look up your local fire station. You can go on firescotland.gov.uk and you can apply for a home fire safety visit. It's free and we can help point you in the, in the right way, especially when it comes to fire safety. What can you do in the event of a fire? How can the family help? You can create a, a, an escape plan. You can create a, a safe room. You can make sure that the things within your house are safe and we can give advice on electrics and stuff, um, especially overloading sockets. Um, one visit to your house can reduce the risk significantly, so there's a lesser chance of you having a fire. We can also link in with partnership agencies. We've been doing that for years, but probably the most important one right now during cost of living is Home Energy Scotland. Um, we've we've done plenty of visits even before cost of living, before COVID. Um, we've referred to other support agencies out with the fire services remit and we can help point people in the right direction. Home Energy Scotland is an absolutely fantastic one because they can help reduce your energy costs by providing more bespoke advice, um, look into grants and other um, financial hardship incentives that might be uh, provided by the government. And also we offer risk recognition training. We've got two little safety centres, one in Pollock, one that's getting set up at Calton Fire Station. Uh, and we can get a group of people in, do a more developed version of this presentation, go over fire safety, do some practical exercises because nobody likes um, death by PowerPoint. Take a look, uh, We go over fire action plans, take you into the fire simulator room, take you into our hazard room. And that's really good, especially if, if you're working with people who you might be considered high risk. So we get social workers in, we get any uh, occupational therapists, we get housing officers in and a lot, I mean, the best thing about that is that the assistance that we provide is universal. It applies to your personal life and also your business life as well. So it's, it is definitely something to look out for. And you can contact the fire service um, on firescotland.gov.uk with an 0800 number. And if you're out with Glasgow, we can link you in with the local community action team. There's there's a lot of us, we're, we're all throughout Scotland. And the best thing is that a lot of everything that we provide is free of charge. And I finished on 28 minutes. So I did say it would only take half, well, about half an hour. So good timing. For those that are watching this online, thanks a lot for tuning in.